This is Nick Park from Evangelical Alliance Ireland and once again I'm here to remind you that it might be Friday but Sunday is coming. Over the last two weeks I've had a number of requests from different church leaders saying Nick can you not go on behalf of Evangelical Alliance and push the government for us to meet earlier than the current, uh, what, the current schedule, which would have churches and places of worship being opened up again after the 20th of July. In other words, in, in phase four of the government's roadmap to reopening after lockdown. Now, uh, I've had the same conversation several times with different people because I think we are all feeling the frustration of not being able to meet together as church. The whole online thing was very exciting at first. It's starting to get old quite quickly and we just want to meet together face to face because while we, we're doing everything we can and we just appreciate the many innovative ways churches are ministering online, in the end there is no substitute for the fellowship, the communion, the koinonia of Christians meeting together as God's people. However, having said all of that, I've been having the same conversation with so many people that I felt it was necessary to make a statement for everyone to understand the stance that Evangelical Alliance Ireland and myself are taking at this time. First of all, well, it would be pretty pointless to go and approach the government whenever the to get, uh, the Catholic Church, the Church of Ireland, the Presbyterian Church and the Methodist Church have already made a joint public statement uh, reaffirming their uh, compliance with and approval of the current schedule for reopening churches. Uh, while acknowledging the pain and saying how difficult they are finding it, they said this, this was a statement, that, a joint statement that was released on the 4th of May. We recognize, however, as we have said previously, that to be a community in the real sense of the word means that as individuals we acknowledge our interdependence. In loving our neighbors it is important that we all look out for one another and continue to adhere to government advice on social distancing and other measures. The current restrictions are challenging, but are for the common good and the protection of everyone across our island. That was a joint statement by the Catholic Church, Church of Ireland, Presbyterian and Methodist Church, released on the 4th of May. For evangelicals to then go and try to seek an exemption and say, well, we never mind what they all say, we want our church and we want it now, would actually mark us out as being the ones who aren't seeking the common good and the ones who aren't interested in the protection of everyone. So after that statement has been made by those four churches, it basically means that any approach by Evangelical Alliance Ireland would have zero chance of being listened to in any successful way. But even so, I wouldn't approach the government with that request anyway. Because the government has made it clear that any changes to the schedule must be supported by medical science. And there's no medical science argument that I can see to support having churches starting in an earlier phase. In fact, we are already receiving preferential treatment. In phase four, we're being classed with museums and galleries. Now, my experience of church services is that the whole dynamic in numbers of people, in interaction, and particularly in the amount of speaking and singing which releases moisture droplets into the air, which we are told in an in enclosed space can travel a lot further than two meters, and being together for a much longer period of time. To be honest, the dynamic of church services from a medical science and public health standpoint should actually put us in phase five, along with theatres and cinemas and bowling alleys and bingo halls, pubs, nightclubs, gyms, dance studios and concerts. They are much closer to the kind of dynamic from a public health and medical science standpoint than museums or art galleries. 
So we're actually already be receiving preferential treatment and being allowed to open earlier than strict medical science would say. And that is because the government does recognise how important religion is to such a large number of people and the fact of how people's mental health, for example, are greatly aided by their participation in being part of a church or a religious community. Now, then you get people who say, well, what if garden centres are allowed to open, then churches should be. Come on, that is foolishness. Because the dynamic of what happens when people, particularly in the limited numbers, are allowed to enter a garden centre compared to a church, there is no comparison. You know, you can walk round your local Woody's or home base or wherever else and uh, you, you, you probably won't get within six feet of anybody except when you're standing at the checkout. And nobody's going to be singing and shouting round the place while you're there in comparison to your average church. So we need to, we need to be careful about making foolish comparisons that do not do us any credit whatsoever as believers. So in no way are we being discriminated against or treated unfairly, and quite the opposite. And to argue that the government is somehow being anti-Christian or anti-Catholic in making churches wait until phase four, it, it's, it, that argument does not stand up to reason or scrutiny. And also, we should be very grateful that Ireland is behaving cautiously, because we should want to be more like New Zealand or South Korea or Norway where they've done a good job of controlling the virus rather than the countries that are doing a bad job of controlling it like the UK or Brazil or Sweden. Yes, I did say Sweden because I'm hearing a number of Christians saying, well, look at Sweden. They're, they're being more lax about things and we should be like them and then we could have church and they're still doing grand. Well, actually, they're not. I have close contacts with Sweden. I've ministered there quite a few times over the last few years. Last time was in October. I had a wonderful time teaching and preaching with the Pentecostal Church in uh, Jönköping. And uh, I was actually involved in an online event uh, recording, a Zoom recording, with my friend Daniel Alm. Daniel is the superintendent of the Pentecostal churches in Sweden. And Daniel shared that actually in Sweden, all church services over 50 people have, have been banned. And in fact, most of the Pentecostal churches, because they have a lot of larger churches, uh, some of them thousands of people, most of the Pentecostal churches have gone online because it's just impossible for them to hold physical meetings with a cap of 50 people. Uh, some smaller churches have been able to keep on meeting. One church that did attempt that was uh, my own denomination has a church in Stockholm. And sadly, in the early onset of the coronavirus there, a wonderful young lady that was the praise and worship leader died of, of coronavirus. But uh, Sweden is much more relaxed with bars and restaurants. Uh, in fact, Christians in Sweden would have a much greater argument for saying they are being treated unfairly than Christians in Ireland. Um, in fact, if you compare Sweden with Ireland, they aren't doing grand. You know, Sweden, or rather Ireland, should have a much higher death rate per head of population than Sweden. Why? Because one of the peculiar peculiarities when you look at different countries is that the coronavirus tends to uh, be much more fatal in smaller countries than large countries. If you look, for example, at a list of the countries with the most deaths per head of population, you'll see San Marino, you'll see Andorra, and you will see the tiny island of St. Martin, because a pandemic can much more easily run through a small population with its, all its interconnections. And also, of course, Sweden is in a region, uh, Scandinavia, that has been much less affected by coronavirus than our own part of Europe. Now, a few weeks ago, as we should have expected, Ireland did have a higher death rate per capita than Sweden. But not anymore. Because as, as our lockdown procedures have been reducing the number of deaths, over the last two weeks, Ireland has seen 210 deaths. Every one of them is a tragedy. Sweden, with twice our population, has seen 831 deaths. 
So in terms, and so Sweden has actually gone from having a better death rate per head of population to having over the last two weeks double the death rate per head of population of Ireland. You see, that's the difference that a lockdown is making. And rather than trying to compare Ireland with Sweden, you'd be better comparing Norway. Norway has a similar sized population to Ireland, 5.3 million people, and they followed a strict lockdown as we have. And over the last two weeks, Norway has seen 18 deaths. That's right, Sweden's death rate per head of population is 23 times greater than that of Norway. That's the difference that a lockdown makes. Now we hear people talking about, well, they're getting herd immunity. Well, hardly. Less than 8% of the population in Stockholm have antibodies to, to the virus. And herd immunity only kicks in when you're at the 70% or 80% mark. So based, and that's just Stockholm, not the rest of the country. So based on current statistics, for Sweden to reach a point where the nation would have herd immunity of any useful kind, it would actually involve an, another 50,000 to 100,000 deaths in their country, which nobody would want. I'm, I'm baffled that anyone who claims to be pro-life is upset by Ireland taking a cautious approach. And when I hear people talking about herd immunity, that owes more to eugenics than to Christianity. It's about, it's about allowing the weak and the vulnerable to die in order that the young and healthy can carry on with their lives. You know, next Monday marks two years since we had a referendum in Ireland. During that referendum on abortion, I argued that a human life is of infinite worth. That includes unwanted lives, lives that are going to be terminated because they're the wrong gender, because they're likely to be disabled or have severe abnormalities that would maybe only cause them to live a short period of time and maybe that would all be in the womb, or because the child would be a product of rape. I argued against abortion in all those circumstances, not because I wanted to minimize the sacrifices involved in having a child in those circumstances, but because the sacrifices are not greater than the value of saving every human life. So I argued against abortion on economic grounds, against abortion on emotional grounds, against abortion even where people were threatening suicide. And now these are the same arguments, the self-same arguments that were used against me to argue for abortion two years ago are now being used to support the concept of herd immunity and a rush out of lockdown. The economic cost, the emotional cost, the fear that people will start committing suicide unless we come out of lockdown. Those arguments were wrong two years ago as an argument against valuing human life and they're still wrong today. Back during the abortion referendum, uh, somebody sent a letter to Leo Varadka talking about bears in the woods, which created great hilarity in the press, which was very unfair, I feel, to the pro-life side during that debate. And it was actually a very good argument. It was saying this, that if you're out hunting in the woods and you see something brown and furry and you're, let's say you're slightly sure or even probably sure that it's a human being, but it might be a woman in a fur coat. Well, since you're probably right, you can just go ahead and shoot it anyway. And the argument was saying that if there's any doubt at all, you should err on the side of caution. And it was about the fact of because there's no scientifically agreed criteria at what point personhood begins. Now we have a theological uh, position on that, but scientifically people don't know. Nobody scientifically knows when somebody becomes a human being and a person in their own right or not. That's, that's a moral, a philosophical, a theological argument. And so the bear in the woods argument was saying, if you're in any way in doubt, then you should err on the side of caution. Therefore, we should not be aborting unborn children, even if we think there's a tiny possibility that they might be human beings. I used a drink driving analogy that you know drink driving will cost lives and any sensible reasonable person will not try to drink right up to the point of the legal limit but will refrain from drinking and driving at all because it's better safe than sorry. Well 
that's because the risks of getting it wrong on the side of being over adventurous are far more devastating than the risk of erring on the side of caution. If I err on the side of caution when it comes to drink driving or shooting at brown hairy things in woods, uh, what's, what is the worst that can happen? The worst can happen is my hunting is spoiled or you know what, I have to get it, pay an extra for a taxi when I could have got a car. But if you get it wrong the other way, you take a human life and that's not a risk that's worth taking. Well today it's the same thing with how we come out of this lockdown. We don't say, oh well, I'm probably sure that we'll be all right, so let's come out quickly, and oops, oh dear, we killed a lot of people. Ah well, never mind. We can't take that. We can't take that approach. Pro-life people should never take that approach. I made myself unpopular in certain quarters two years ago when I stood up for the value of, hu of human life, including the unborn life. And maybe I'm making myself unpopular now when I say that the lives of the elderly, the lives of those with diabetes and heart conditions and kidney dialysis, the lives of people with Alzheimer's, the lives of people with learning difficulties in institutional settings, their lives are important and need to be cherished and need to be protected at all cost. If that makes me unpopular among my fellow believers, that will grieve me. It may be that some will no longer want to support the work that Evangelical Alliance are doing because I've taken this position and made this statement. And if so, that will grieve me, not because I want to be popular, but because my heart is to unite Bible-believing Christians, not to be a divisive figure. But my biblical convictions and my valuing of every human life compel me to state this. If the medical scientists decide that the R rate, the reproduction rate of the virus, has improved so well that they bring everything in phase four forward to an earlier date, us and the galleries and the museums, then I will rejoice. And I will work as hard as anyone else to get ready for reopening earlier than we thought was going to happen. But unless that happens, I will not be pushing for an earlier restart for church services. And I believe to do so would not help, but would rather hinder the cause of evangelical Christianity in Ireland. Meanwhile, I will be continuing to pray for our government and the HSE officials. I think I've prayed for them more in these last few weeks than I ever have in my life. I've not always been fully obedient to the scriptures that command us to pray for those in government over us. But I want to tell you, I'm taking it very seriously now. And I'm committed to doing everything I can to help churches get ready for relaunch in ways that are safe, effective in pastoring the sheep, caring for our own and reaching the lost, and in ways that will not bring shame or reproach to the evangelical Christian community. You know, it might be Friday. Sometimes it feels like a hard Friday. But Sunday is coming. I believe God has a great future for his church in this land. And we cannot blow it by trying to rush into something that will end up harming us and harming the people around us and ultimately harming the cause of Christ. Yes, it is Friday, but Sunday's coming.